Good afternoon and good morning. Welcome back to the Charlie Mike webinar series hosted by the National Veterans Small Business Co Coalition. Thank you for joining us today. Hold on. We're stuck. <laughs> I'd like to thank the four, the four companies that made this webinar series possible. Okay, today's runtime is one hour and the webinar is being recorded. If you have any questions during the webinar, please type it on the right hand of your screen on the question box. Uh, the slides and recording will be posted on the Charlie Mike webinar series replay webpage. Next. And again, you know, you know who I am. I'm Earl Morgan, Program Director for the MSBC. Again, thank you for joining us. Actually, today is my last day as moderator. Uh, Scott Jensen will be joining us next week to close out the webinar series. And I say the two best speakers for last. So I'd like to introduce Guy Timberlake. And of course he spoke before and he's the executive visionary officer for GovCon Club. Guy, thank you for joining us and the floor is now yours. Awesome, awesome, Earl, appreciate it, man. And uh, always good to be hanging out with Batman. You know, always have fun. <laughs> <laughs> Looking forward to uh, Orlando too, and uh, being able to hang out there and uh, see everyone in person again after all this time too. Um, folks, thank you all very much for uh, allowing me to come back into your home and, and present information to you uh, about um, you know today. You know, it's, it's all government contracting. Today we're going in a slightly different direction. I think my first program we talked about one of my favorite topics and that is uh, simplified acquisitions. And most people that know me or know of me know that is something that I'm passionate about. Uh, I was on the ground selling to the government uh, six years before that became a thing, uh, before the FASA rule was passed. And uh, we teach companies every day about getting their foot in the door to get their first contract or their next contract uh, using simplified acquisitions. But obviously we work across government in a lot of different areas. And Happy to tell you about that anytime you feel that uh, you'd like to know more about us and the GovCon Club. Um, our contribution today is coming from our program that we call DYK GovCon, uh, or Do You Know Government Contracting? And this is a series we do uh, uh, for our members and our partners uh, that is all about answering fundamental questions uh, in government contracting that a lot of folks may have missed or never had a chance to truly learn. And today's program is all about NAICS codes. And so the, we, we gave Earl the uh, title, you know, the naked truth about federal procurement. Well, here's our take uh, on that. And uh, hopefully you find this useful and enjoy it. Uh, the DYK GovCon series is very much like the Charlie Mike series. This is just our version, our brand of programming meant to give you information that you can use to make good decisions. Uh, GovCon Club, if you don't know, is actually the rebirth of the American Small Business Coalition. It's an organization we started in 2004, uh, working with small, medium, and large companies and government agencies. And uh, we have a lot of fun. Uh, and, and our members have realized and tell us they realize a lot of success in the things that we do. Uh, unlike the, the very noble mission that NVSBC has, um, ASBC is solely focused on uh, tactical activities and some strategy. Uh, we're showing you how to do the business and, and we leave the really other, the other good work uh, done to organizations like NVSBC. Uh, for those that don't know, Scott Dennis and I uh, have been colleagues and friends for a number of years. We served together on the board of directors for the American Freedom Foundation run by SMA Tilly. And uh, Scott was actually one of my board members for the American Small Business Coalition when we started back in 2004. So we have a little history with, with Scott and the veterans community. And uh, again, really happy to be here. If you have questions about the information we offer up, uh, here's my contact information. Feel free to shoot me a note. You can find me on LinkedIn uh, pervasively, uh, always on Clubhouse, running programs out there. And just again, kind of another nod towards uh, my love and my support for the veteran community. I am one of the certified instructors for the National VIP Center, uh, the Veteran for Institute Procurement Program, and uh, just finished up so supporting one of the cohorts uh, just last week. 
If you don't know about that program, it's the Montgomery County Chamber of Commerce. They do phenomenal things. And I know that uh, that uh, NBSBC is putting together a program uh, like that. And I look forward to contributing in any way I can to make that a super strong program. I know it will be, but hopefully uh, we get the call to support that as well. So a lot of you that uh, may have heard of me or, or know me might know about the phrase connecting the dots. I didn't invent it. This was long in use before uh, I started doing what I do now. Uh, my background is in the intelligence community. And so that's where it came from for me. And obviously after 9-11, it hit more of the street for the general public to use also. But it, it's, it's a true statement for who we are and what we do as government contractors. We need information to be able to make good decisions about everything going on around us and we need to be able to find that information and also use that information. So my belief is that connecting dots can be done when you know how to find those dots and also understand what those dots mean. This is another contribution to helping you understand where the dots are and, and how to use them. So here's how we're gonna start. Basically, the US government, if you don't already know this, has a number of different systems that they use to classify and identify various things like activities, assets, and so forth. Some of the examples of these uh, classifications include things like programs and projects. If you work in the world of IT uh, and even outside of IT, you might be familiar with the designation referred to as a UII. Unique Investment Identifier. If you work in IT and this is the first time you've seen or heard that, call me, I'll tell you where you can find it, what it means, and how it will help you work less hard to execute business development in the IT arena. Contract IDs, everyone sees contract numbers, we take them for granted. We don't think that there's actually a real system behind them, but they're actually known formally as a PIID a procurement instrument identifier. And if you don't know that that contract number tells a story, tells you what organization issued it, tells you the fiscal year, tells you the type of contract and so on. And if you understand those elements, again, you're ahead of the curve. If you work on the federal supply schedule, the VA or the GSA schedule, you might be familiar with the term called a SIN. It's not a bad thing, it's a special item number that designates what is being sold in each of the categories tied to specific schedules. If you work in the financial industry whatsoever with in-government contracting, you might be familiar with a thing called an OCC or an object class code. And a couple of the other ones include the one that tells you how the government is gonna use something that they're buying, whether it's a product or a service. That's actually a NAICS code. Right? This one throws people sometimes. Goods and services that are actually purchased by the government are known as a PSC, a product service code. And then organization IDs for the government, the way we can count the number of actual funding and contracting activities that are out there doing things, we can recognize them based on their DODAC. Not sure why that bounced out so quick. I'll fix that, sorry. So the DODAC is a term that you need to understand if you wanna be able to identify specific contracting or funding organizations throughout the government. What we're gonna focus on in this presentation is NAICS codes. We wanna clear the air about what this really is. A lot of folks have some uh, uh, bad information about what a NAICS code is, and a lot of folks use it as a, a leading driver for their market research. Hopefully by the end of this, you will understand why you might want to modify your behavior in this area. So let's talk about what NAICS codes are. So first and foremost, a NAICS code is a six digit classification system. It was originally established in the 1930s as a four digit system. Those were the SIC codes, the standard industrial classification systems. And they're used to classify establishments, companies, entities like yours, by the type of activity they were engaged in. Now, 1993, OMB revised this program, the NAICS or the SIC. And as a result of that, it was 
cleaned up and repurposed to be used directly in government contracting. Now, here's the trick. What a lot of folks don't realize is that NAICS codes were not created for government contracting. Their actual original purpose and continuing purpose is being used by federal statistical agencies. Think about, you know, um, you know, Bureau of Census, labor statistics, and so forth. That's who this, these were for. And so when you think about the NAICS codes, what they do and what they're showing you is not what somebody wants to buy. It's showing you the industry in which someone, some organization operates. NAICS codes come in 20 flavors, right? The first two digits of every NAICS code is what is known as the industry sector. And you've got 20 groups here, starting with agriculture, forestry, fishing, and hunting, all the way down to public administration. And if you understand the hierarchy of how they're being used, what you understand is, again, those first two digits are the sector. The third digit makes it a subsector. The fourth digit makes it a group. And then the fifth and sixth digits, depending on the country you're in, US, Canada, or Mexico, makes it the actual industry. Now, why am I kind of emphasizing all this industry, industry, industry? Well, here's why. Because when you think about how these are used and look at how they're used, you know, if you've ever heard of the jobs report, for example, you know, it's that analysis done by the Bureau of Labor Statistics to look at you know, how many jobs are being created or lost based on various economic conditions. That's where the NAICS codes were actually created to support. In government contracting, it also supports SBA as they create their small business scorecard. Now, the trick with it is that when SBA does their report card, what they're reporting on is the industries that contracting officers assign to do different jobs. It has no bearing whatsoever on what a company actually sold. You know? And so when you think about it, there's, you have to really kind of determine what the value of that report is you know, for a scorecard and what it's really telling us. Now, the other part about NAICS codes well, that most of us are familiar with is this. That's where the size standards are located. So the size standard, which is usually either number of employees or average annual receipts for the entity concerned, determines what is a small business when the U.S. government wants to set something aside. And those size standards are established by the SBA administrator, and they work with you know, office of size standards and census and others to determine what is going to be the applicable size standard for an industry. All right. There are changes underway right now that are impacting on several groups of size standards. So if you're not aware of this, you should follow the Federal Register, do a uh, keyword on NAICS or North American Industrial Classification System, so you can be kept up to date about how this may change. Now, one of the things I want to kind of further demonstrate about NAICS codes is this. You know, I've said it before, they weren't made for government contracting, which is why if you go look for NAICS codes on a government website, everything you see is ultimately going to point you back to here. This is the NAICS Association, and this is the organization that now manages everything about NAICS and the updates and the you know, transitions and so forth. You know, every X number of years, they update the NAICS codes uh, and the, the, uh, the, the descriptions and so forth. So this is the official home of NAICS codes. It is not a .gov website, which is going to pale in comparison to something I'm going to show you a little later in this presentation. So when you think about it, if you want to identify your industry in SAM, which is what Uncle Sam, no pun intended, is asking you to do when you set up your profile. The NAICS codes are all about what tell us what industries you support. Whereas if you look at the bottom of the page where it talks about product and service codes, that's actually what you're selling. You know, to go even further, if you dig into uh, a system like the old FBO or now known as SAM.gov contract opportunities, 
you'll see information posted in opportunities solicited there about the NAICS codes. Now, here's the trick, and here's kind of part of a challenge that I throw out to everyone that's listening and watching this right now. Go in and do a search in contract opportunities and do a search and look at the first five records that come up and see if you get the same or similar result as to what we're talking about right now. And that is this. If you go into SAM and do a search on your favorite NAICS code and then click on the title of that record, on the left side, you'll see an option to look at diff different elements of that solicitation. Choose the one called classification. And when you do that, you're gonna see something that looks like this. It's gonna show you four elements. It's gonna show you whether or not it's a set aside. It's gonna show you the product service code. It's gonna show you the NAICS code that you selected and then the relevant place for performance. Now, this is the first of four that I'm gonna show you because I only had to look at the first four to get to prove my point. If you look where the arrow is pointing right now, it's pointing to the product service code. Product service code here is DA01. You'll actually see it in the title of that solicitation. And it describes IT and telecom business application, application development support services, labor. Okay, it's a very specific thing, not an industry. It's something that you would sell or something the government would buy. If I go to the second record and I went four in a row for these, didn't cherry pick, I promise. And look at the next one. The common thread between the first and second post here is they're the same NAICS code. So if I click on classification, you'll see down there the third item, NAICS code is exactly the same, but now I've got another PSC code. It's different, DG10, IT and telecom, network as a service. If I go to the third record, Dell Hardware Support, and click on classification, I've got another PSC code. This one starts with a number. That means it's a product, not a service. So if I'm a services company and I'm looking at these records right now, and let's say I do the work in the first one, well, although the second one is a service, that's not what I do. And the third one's a product. And that's definitely not what I do. So then when I go to the fourth record and hit classification, I got another one, DF10, IT management as a service. And again, I do the first one, but not the other three. So already out of four records, only 25% of what I pulled up in my search was relevant to me. Think about the impact in time and money you spend if you're looking for work in this fashion. And whether or not you have keywords in there or not, using the NAICS code as a leading criteria, again, is a search based on industry and not on what the government wants to buy. So having said that, if you go look historically in the federal procurement data system at purchases being done in there, where the US government is listing every transaction for goods and services they buy, Yes, there is a NAICS code listed, but what most people miss is there's also a product service code. So again, if you do services and you were doing research to find service opportunities, like an expiring contracts report, well, guess what? That D is a service. If it starts with the letter, it's a service. So you're in the right hunt, but if you don't do those specific services, let's say your, your services are more project management, well, then you're in the wrong category. The NAICS code is going to stay the same for lots of things you look at. So all that said, FPDS and then the sister site, which pulls information from FPDS, USA Spending, will show you the product service code all the time. Now, the reason we're talking about this so adamantly, and I'm not near done, got some more great information for you to really help this sink in is starting here. Why does and how does a contracting officer select a NAICS code for a requirement? Well, here you go. This is the part in FAR 19 that tells you they'll determine the appropriate NAICS code by classifying the product or service being acquired in the one industry that best describes the principal purpose of the supply or service being acquired. 
There's nothing in there about it being what they're going to buy. And there's nothing in there about the size standard. The size standard is a follow on to selecting the right NAICS code by the, what the description is. So when you think about the number of you know, NAICS code challenges, things like this, why so many companies lose them a lot of times, that's one of the reasons. We have the wrong idea, wrong understanding of what it is a NAICS code does. So from a market research standpoint, my opinion is the value of NAICS codes from market research is very little. It tells me when the SBA small business size standards apply for things that I'm looking for, and it tells me what industry sectors I can operate in. So here comes the naked truth. The naked truth about these is there is a government hosted website for the other classification code. In fact, the product service code, which you can find not only in acquisition.gov, but here at psctool.us, this is a DOD website. The PSC codes and the FSC codes were created by the government, DOD and GSA. NAICS codes, not so much. And so when you come into a system like the PSC tool and you look under something like category management, if you're in IT, you probably know what that is, or Better Buying Power Initiative, which is the DOD acquisition strategy enacted back in 2010. If you come on this site and look under the categories that relate to what it is your company does, what you will see are the number of PSC codes that come under each category, and in, in the blue boxes are the actual PSC codes representing what the government is gonna buy when they're leveraging a product or a service from a specific category. NAICS codes are not part of the makeup of the nomenclature for classific classifications for either BBI or category management. And again, acquisition.gov, and psctool.us will show that to you. You know, same thing, if I work in facilities services and I go click on that category, I can find out, hey, look, here's all the different PSC codes that relate to me in this industry and I can drill down. You don't need to look at all 500. You can drill down into purchases and leases, natural resources management and so forth to look at the 30 or 20 that might be relevant to that specific category or subcategory. Now, to take this even further, if you work with DOD, <clears throat> there's a document you may have seen. If you haven't, I'll take credit for showing it to you first. Fairly new, and what it does is it basically dictates and demonstrates where DOD is from the standpoint of thinking which of these classifications is more important. And what they're showing you is this. Step number one, identify your product or service. Further, they go on to say, know the product service codes and the NAICS codes for your products, services, or industry in which your organization normally does business. So again, PSC is your products and service, NAICS code ties to the industry. This is coming out of OUSDA TNL. So it's pretty much, you know, in short of the sec def, this is you know who dictates how things are being done. This is their document for doing business with DOD on how to engage with them. NAICS codes are secondary here. Same way they're ranked in FPDS, they're below the product service code. So if you've never seen PSC codes before, unlike NAICS codes that have 20 groups, PSC codes have 114. They are much more granular than a NAICS code is. And so if you look at the first two columns in the top half of the third one, those are all products. These are all the, de the designations for products that the U.S. government was going to buy. And so they're all four positions long. So 1035 or 5930, you know, 9614. Those are how their codes are, are pre presented when it comes to products. 
for services, they start with letters. If it starts with the letter A, it is research and development. B through Z are all the other service groups that the US government buys. And again, four characters long. So if you work in IT, you're probably looking for a D3 something or another. If you look in IT under services, like professional services, project program management and so forth, you're looking for something that starts with an R. If you teach, you're looking for something that starts with a U and so on and so on. And so they're telling you, again, just like in the PSC tool, exactly what it is they want to buy. And, and to show you one last example here, you know, if we go back and look at government spending as of April 20th of this year, you know, at that time, federal agencies had obligated $208 billion. Now, that doesn't include the 90 days of DOD that we can't see because of the OPSEC blackout. And at that time, the U.S. government had referenced 1,072 unique NAICS codes. At the same time, with under those NAICS codes, they had referenced 2,406 unique product service codes. Now, let me just kind of mention pretty quick, you know, NAICS codes began in 1998. I started my career in 1988. And what it means is the first 10 years of my life in this industry, the word NAICS code was not a thing. It didn't apply to us, it didn't exist. If you go on FPDS and look at historical transactions, prior to 1998, you will not see NAICS codes. You will see product service codes. And so with those 1,000 and 2,400 NAICS codes and PSC codes referenced, I picked one. I picked 541519 for all the IT companies in the room. And at the time, other computer-related services represented $7 billion in spending year to date. Now, most people look at this, they say, yep, my NAICS code is 541519. Pretty much whatever comes out of that, I'm going for it because they're talking about me. But if you guys follow my logic whatsoever about you know three flavors of PSC codes, product, re research and development and service, then I want you to understand that there were 369 unique PSC codes referenced under 541519. And of the 7 billion obligated at that time, 2 billion of it was spent on products. Right, 128 of the 369 PSC codes referenced. Another 4.4 million was obligated for research and development under 19 of the codes. Now, if you're looking at these numbers thinking, okay, you know what? There's still a lot of codes left and a lot of money left. So I'm gonna be good. I'm gonna be solid because there's still a big chunk for me to work with. Well, you'd be right to a certain point. 5 billion under 222 of the service codes, except Remember that list A through Z I showed you? That five billion was split was split between 19 of those 24 service groups. So if you don't do medical training, architecture, you know, maintenance and so forth, then guess what? Not all of this is a good fit for you because that's where a bunch of this money went. So here's what we recommend. You know, first and foremost, Consider revising your tactics for market research. Go take the challenge that I showed you earlier. Go into contract opportunities, punch in your favorite NAICS code. You can even assign it to your favorite agency. And then do a search and look at the first five options that come up. Only looking for real solicitations, not RFIs, not um, sources sought, and not special notices, real live buys and click on the title of the opportunity and then look at the classification. Click that button and take note of the PSC code in the first five. My guess is you're gonna see at least three unique PSC codes in those results. And if that's true, then you're already over 50% and that speaks to efficiency. How much time do you spend looking at stuff that doesn't matter to you? And so if you were to flip your searches and lead off with the PSC code and the other criteria you use, agency, keyword, all the above, 
you will get a better result. And by the way, when you think about, you know, NAICS codes and PSC codes, you know, I mentioned that under 541519, you know, there were, you know, 369 different R, um, PSC codes referenced. Well, if you look at another one like 541330, last fiscal year, represented 40 billion in spending and over 800 different PSC codes referenced under it. The number one was R425, right? Represented 13 billion of that 14, uh, 40 billion. Well, if you flip that and detach that R425, that program management support PSC code from that engineering services NAICS code, all of a sudden it grows from 13 billion to, th to almost 30 billion, $29.4 billion. And it gets referenced by 245 different NAICS codes. So I don't know how many you got in your SAM profile, I'm guessing it's not 245, but based on that, there's no way you would have ever tracked every one of those opportunities if a NAICS code is part of your market research strategy. So the second or third thing I'll mention is this. If you've got a SAM profile and you do not have PSC codes in your SAM profile, here's what that means. If a contracting officer comes to look for you based on what they want to buy and all you have in your profile is NAICS codes, you're not going to be found because they will be using a PSC code or at least a PSC code group to look for what they want to buy and it won't exist for you. It won't be there. Now, here's the beautiful thing. Trends are easily identifiable. I'm talking big picture. I'm up here at government-wide level. The minute you drill down into a customer organization, and I don't mean just DOD or just Army, I mean go deeper go into Army Contracting Command, go into PEO Stride, someone like that, all of a sudden, those NAICS codes and PSC codes become fewer, less diverse. You will start to detect trends in how the agency uses it or the activity or the unit. And that's where you start getting traction because they tend to call things the same thing over and over again. So if you see it once, you'll probably see it twice and a third time. So update your SAM profile. The other part is this. Look for those trends. Look for how your customer is using them. If you don't yet have business with a government agency, look at a partner organization or a competitor that is doing business in that same customer and use them as the baseline. And what it will do is it will allow you to really streamline your business development activities all the way from the beginning, market research, all the way through qualification. So that's what I've got for you today. That is the, the, the presentation. And, and I kept this one deliberately short because we typically get a lot of questions uh, around this topic because in some instances, it's kind of polarizing because what people have known their entire life in government contracting is NAICS codes. That's what everyone talks about. Well, here's the trick, not for me. Again, NAICS codes didn't come around until my 10th year uh, in doing business here. It's the same thing. You know, we talk about GWACs. GWACs are so pervasive nowadays. GWACs didn't come around until Clinger Cone was passed, and I was at least six years into my career before they were born. So there's a lot of stuff here that is new, and it doesn't yet have the traction that uh, some people think it does, and so we like to try to clear the air. So. Earl, that's what I got for you, sir. All right, that's great. Um, I'm going to wait for our, our attendees to think of some questions, but I have three for you. They're pretty okay. easy. Um, why do small business offices and contracting officers always refer to a next code? So it, it, it's a couple things. So ever since the size standards were attributed to them, um, and if you understand kind of the purpose of what a small business office does, they're rated based on their success of getting small businesses engaged uh, and, and, and working with the agency. And so what they're looking at is they're looking for ways to uh, identify a specific industry. Uh, they're looking for ways to determine, you know, from a size standard, what is going to be the notional range for those companies that are going to be in the room. And, and look, we've all done it, myself included. We have all done NAICS code shopping before. 
You know, Earl's my buddy at Air Force Small Business. Earl, do me a favor, man. Convince him to use this Nate's code that only has a $12 million size standard so I can keep the big guys out of here. All right. And, and that's how the game is being played by a lot of folks. And that's why some of the challenges that are lodged are not successful because the other Nate's code doesn't match up to the purpose of why the government's going to use uh, what they're buying for that one. So that's what I've seen um, over the years. And I've talked to folks in government, and that's honestly the answer. That's just what they've known ever since these were rolled out in 98. Okay. Um, so aren't PSE codes only used by DOD? Yeah, and, and that's funny because you would think so, but I remember in the early days that there were actually two systems, and there were PSC codes and the FSC, the Federal Supply Classifications. And over the years, they merged these two together. So when you, when you see those systems, the numbers and the letters, it actually is two different systems, but they just call it one now. And so every transaction, if you go look in FPDS right now, every agency required to post transactions in FPDS, which is 72 top level organizations, they are required to indicate what they buy by entering a product service code on every single transaction. And that predates the birth of NAICS codes in 98. So if you go look in SAM, or sorry, FPDS, back into the 80s, uh, in there, you will see PSC codes in use. So they are used by every agency that reports to that system. Okay, great. And I'm gonna skip my last question, and go straight to Dan's question, because this is such a, this is a great question, because okay. I had issues with this as well. Um, when searching on SAM.gov, is there a software matrix that you can refer to cut out time searching dramatically? And I understand <laughs> what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? If there is, I don't know of it yet. What I will tell you is, um, you know, whether you're using SAM or a paid service, you know, the principles still apply. Um, you need to have a process for how you're going to identify what matters most to you. And so if, if your company has identified those things, such as, you know, what we sell, and we know that when we talk about this thing that we sell, these three agencies use these four PSC codes and these eight NAICS codes when they talk about it. So I would start there uh, and identify those trends. Look for as much evidence as you can find to look for the classifications. The keywords are a big part of it too. Um, and then the other part is also looking at who you're working with. A lot of folks search on or do these advanced searches or the right. search agents, and they're just getting everything. I mean, they're getting everything from DOD. Man, God bless you, because my, my head would explode uh, with that much information. And so you also need to think about who your customers are. Um, you know, none of us, you know, short of Lockheed Martin, can truly call DOD a customer, um, you know, because they've got the size, girth, and manpower to actually pull something like that off. So think about who your customer is. It's not going to be the Army or the Air Force. It's going to be an organization, whether a program or operational activity inside uh, of that organization that you want to focus on, and then dress them down, and you'll see all the things you want to see. But Dan, I wish there was, and if I hear one, I will make sure I look, get that over to Earl ASAP because um, I know the pain associated with this. Uh, we, whoever thought we'd all be wishing for Fed Biz Ops again? <laughs> right, <laughs> right. <laughs> I used to live on that website when I was working for another company. Yep. Um, <laughs> that's what we're laughing because I'm telling you, just going through that, it was like, I need a drink after this. <laughs> oh. Absolutely. Trust me, there are many, many bottles, you know, right. <laughs> make their match using those systems. Great. All right. My last question, and I want to open up to uh, our attendees. Are PSC codes required in SAM.gov registrations? So that's a great question. And they're not required, but there is a space for them. And, and so, again, you know, the only required use of a product service code is in for the contracting officer entering that system or entering that information into their contract writing system. That is where it is absolutely required. Now, I'll add a couple other places where it has been used and required. 
So anyone remembers the recompetition of GSA Alliance? Um, when they recompeted GSA Alliance, small business and full and open, GSA applied PSC codes for past performance. All right, you had three categories. You got a certain number of points for the number of PSC codes you could boast about in your past performance. And it inevitably changed the landscape uh, of the market for, for um, Alliance based on, on doing that approach. And a lot of people lost a lot of sleep uh, over make over that change. We're seeing it more and more. But, but again, the part I wanna emphasize is, you know, when you think about PSC code use, um, they're not required in SAM. However, I've had more than one contracting officer tell me, if I'm gonna go look for a company in SAM based on what I wanna buy, if they don't have PSC codes, I'm not gonna find them. So there's one. The other part is, and, and Earl's probably looked at these all the time because he's that kind of guy. Um, <laughs> if you ever looked at a congressional spending report, you know, mm -hmm. armed, armed services, you know, committee, the whole thing, and look at the line item descriptors on those reports, those are PSC code descriptions, not NAICS code descriptions. So they're telling you how much, how many billions of dollars they're going to spend based on the product service code description. Uh, and so that's kind of where I put it. And the last part is category management. You know, most of us know about category management, the old strategic sourcing that most of us hate. Um, but the whole point is the nomenclature, the classification system that they use to dictate what they're going to buy under not only category management, but under better buying power initiative is a product service code. Outstanding. Um, Dan said, thank you for the clarity. Um, any more questions from the attendees? Give you guys a couple of seconds to, to think about it. Sure. Um, for that, um, I want to thank Guy. Uh, and, you know, he has a passion for veteran small business. And we've known each other for a long time. And he's been part of NVSBC for a long time. So when he calls me about, or, about something, I know it's about veterans. I know it's pretty serious. And and he's always willing to help out. So, uh, Guy, thank you so much. I That's hope sweet. I see you on, on a beach in Orlando in November. <laughs> <laughs> we go to SeaWorld and, and hang out together party, after the conference. Party with the fishes. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm looking forward to it. Looking forward to it. Yeah. Go, go get me one of those uh, cut rate Southwest fairs that they're doing that special sale on and, oh, yeah. <laughs> and get, my, get my tickets. <laughs> I'm still driving down. Hey, get to ride in the Batmobile when, you, when I see you in November. So. <laughs> That's right. I'm look. I'm looking for. I said. I'm. I am. Uh, I'm happy. You know that things seem to be turning around right now, and I. I can't wait to get out and about and in front of people again because I've missed people. Uh, you know, yeah. and and uh, it's going to be nice to be able to start getting back to whatever the new new normal is going to be. I'm ready for it. Yeah, me too. Me too. I know people are excited to do an in-person conference. Unfortunately, they're getting tired of these virtual meetings and webinars. Oh so man! Luckily, next week is the last one, so we have to worry about that. <laughs> Excellent. We won't go in person after this, so. Yeah, but, and look, you know, tell tell folks, you know, if they want to reach out to me, you know, mm -hmm. I flashed my contact information in the deck earlier. Uh, yep. They can ping me, you know, always on LinkedIn. You know, email works too. And if they have questions about this, um, they want to see some references. I can point them in yep. directions of information. Anyone, anything I can do to help them. You know, this for me, it's about time and money. How do I help you save time and money on the activities you do to find and win business? And I'll, we've been teaching this now for about 13 years. Um, and I, I have plenty of folks over the years keep telling me, I remember when you told me about those and I can measure, you know, how much that has helped us save uh, over the years. And that's that's all we're trying to do. You're right. Yeah. So, OK. This, don't see any more questions coming in. Um, Guy, again, thank you so much for doing this. Um, I know we're going to collect in Orlando. And everybody, please join us next week for the final webinar for the Charlie Mike webinar series. Uh, Scott Densmore will be back online. So this recording will be posted on Friday. I'll try to make it sooner than, than Friday, but bear with me. And so you, you can share the, the recording and the slides. So again, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. And I will see you all next week. Awesome. Thanks All right, a lot, take care, everybody. All right.